Hello, I'm Ruth Allen, Chief Executive of Maswa. July is a month of attention to international social work with the International Federation of Social Workers Global Online Conference happening on the 15th to the 19th of July. And to mark this, I am joined today by Steve Appleton from the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, uh, known as IIMHL. Hello, Steve. Hi, Ruth. It's really lovely to join you. Would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a bit about IIMHL? Well, thank, firstly, thank you for inviting me to, to talk to you today and to uh, talk to your, your members. Um, so I'm Steve Appleton. I uh, represent uh, the International Initiative for Mental Health Leadership, or IIMHL for short, as you say, and I am the regional lead uh, for Europe for that organisation. I'm based uh, here in the UK. Um, I'll say a little bit about IIMHL in just a moment, um, but my, my background is that I, I trained as a social worker uh, literally in the last century. Uh, I qualified in the early 1990s uh, and worked in local authority settings and then joined with colleagues in the NHS. So I, I think I'm probably these days best described as a lapsed social worker, um, but certainly uh, the skills and experiences that I learned both from my training and through my work uh, continue to inform uh, a lot of the work that I'm in, involved in, and I'm involved in a range of other projects as, a, as an independent consultant uh, here in the UK. Um, IIMHL uh, first came about in 2003. It's a membership organization, and it was formed really initially between the United States, uh, England, and New Zealand as a means of trying to bring together uh, different leaders in mental health settings to think about how they could collaborate, work together, learn from one another's experiences, uh, to inform both um, the development of ideas around good practice, uh, both in terms of service delivery, but also in terms of thinking about frameworks and structures for uh, mental health. Um, over the last uh, 17 years, the organization has, has grown and now has uh, nine country members. Uh, those are the United States, Canada, England, Scotland, the Republic of Ireland, uh, Sweden, uh, and the Netherlands, Australia, and New Zealand. I think that adds up to nine. Um, we also have a, a, a partner organization with, within our overall um, agency, which is um, uh, known as Double IDL, which is the International Initiative for Disability Leadership. And our two elements work closely together, particularly thinking about the connections between mental health and, and physical health. Our role and function as an organisation really is to try to bring together leaders internationally, both virtually uh, as well as in person, uh, when uh, rules allow us to do that. Um, we really exist to ensure the rapid exchange of knowledge and information around good practice and innovation uh, at all levels between those countries. Uh, and we do that uh, in a number of different ways. Firstly, people who are members of IIMHL will interact with each other, but also uh, through our specific network meetings. We have a, uh, a biannual uh, international leadership exchange meeting. The next one will be happening in February 2022 uh, down in Christchurch in New Zealand. Last year, it took place in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a large event. Uh, it's unlike any other kind of conference in that the first couple of days are uh, known as matches, where we go into small groups and into deep dives on specific topics. And then we have a, a day to travel, because not all of those matches happen in the host city. Uh, and then we have a, a larger network event for the, for the other couple of days. We're also going to be trialling some regional events. We would have had one in May this year in Scotland for, for Europe, but we're hoping that we'll be able to re-establish that next year. Um, essentially, we're trying to find ways in which we can create the circumstances to do two things, uh, improve and enhance and develop good leadership within the mental health sector uh, by drawing upon the range of knowledge, skills and experiences of people working in those settings across those nine countries, uh, but also to enable the rapid exchange of information, as I say, that can inform and assist people in thinking about how to overcome some of the challenges that exist in trying to develop and deliver effective mental health services, but also to share the successes too. We operate a number of different collaboratives. Uh, just a couple of examples. We, we have two separate collaboratives looking at issues that relate to um, mental health and its impact in cities and urban regions. Uh, and another one that looks at uh, mental health in much more rural settings. 
uh, particularly person, certainly in parts of, of, of England and Scotland, but also in larger countries uh, like the US, Canada and, and Australia. Uh, and we try to find ways in which we can enable people to create their own networks within our, our membership. We're lucky here in England uh, and in Scotland to be well supported by um, the Scottish Executive uh, and also the Department of Health and Social Care in England. Uh, extremely supportive and contribute to, to us as an organisation. Uh, anybody that is in England uh, and working in mental health uh, is able to join and they can do that for free by going to our website, WhyMHL.com. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is that our definition of leadership is deliberately broad. Uh, so we do not classify leadership by profession and we do not classify leadership by seniority or hierarchy. We simply say anybody that has a role in trying to deliver and develop good mental health services, just by that very fact, has a leadership role. So if you are a social worker, whether you're a head of social work or you're an executive director in an adult social care organisation or in, a, in an NHS trust or whatever level you're working at, you will have a leadership role and, and we want to ensure that we create the circumstances to develop that leadership and enable people to have the skills and competences that they need. So I, I think that's probably it in, a, in as much of a, a nutshell. There's some more detail about our mission and, and vision on our website. Steve, thank you. I think that was, uh, gave a really good overview. I think one of the challenges uh, often for social workers in practice, in any area of practice, is to understand how uh, they can connect with you know, the developing strategic and kind of big ideas, global ideas. I mean, we have this in Basel where we are constantly working to ensure that practitioners and our members feel connected in with international social work, for instance, and can see the relevance. And sometimes that's startlingly obvious because we live in a very multicultural international society. Um, but also how, how the fact that we're part of a global profession, for instance, supports us in having shared definitions, shared values, and so on. I was wondering about how you think I and their child can um, reaches practitioners or how practitioners can understand what its relevance is um, for you know how it's going to affect their work now in the future I mean I am MHL is about setting is about setting directions really isn't it for for the for the future of mental health and kind of capturing those great ideas but do, do you think they connect in with 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 um, practitioners experiences and of course ultimately citizens experiences I think that's a really important and, and uh, valid question, Ruth. I mean, my, my sense of this is that what we are trying to do as an organisation and have been doing for the last 17 years is trying to ensure that people working in services are able to access the best examples of innovation and good practice. And I think that, um, in a sense, that kind of applied practice and applied research and, and evidence has never been more important. And our ability to connect individuals to one another, but also to those examples, uh, can have some direct bearing, both on the delivery of services, but also on people's thinking about, is what we're doing now, what's happening in other countries, uh, we're struggling with a particular issue, I wonder if people in Canada are struggling with that, and, and trying to help people to see that there are some consistencies uh, and common things in some of the challenges and obstacles that need to be overcome. But also there are some really tangible solutions out there. Uh, that's not to say that a one size fits all approach works uh, everywhere because it clearly doesn't, but there will be elements of work that's happening in, in other countries that can be drawn upon here to inform people's thinking and, and innovation. And I think enabling practitioners to be bold uh, and to be innovative. I think very often we sit back and think, well, we've always done it this way, it sort of works. Um, and we're in our kind of little English or UK bubble, um, enabling people to see outward and see examples of, of other good work, I think can help people to feel more confident that either they're doing the right thing or that there is a, a range of solutions to overcome challenges and obstacles that they face in their day-to-day -day work. I think more than that rapid exchange of knowledge and information, and I should say, you know, people can make a a call for information at any point and we will go out to our network of members and we have 
dedicated liaisons in each of our countries who can also help with that. If you have a practice issue or you're looking for an example of a, a piece of work you want to find out more about or, or an issue that you want to see what other countries are doing to inform your thinking, just get in touch with us and we can usually turn that around um, within, you know, 48 hours pretty pretty quickly uh, we've got a very large membership uh, individual membership so uh, there's lots of resources out there both in terms of um, electronic resources but also the, the knowledge within the membership that people freely share and I think it is that free sharing we try to create a safe space for people to, to do that uh, where people can say well we tried this and it didn't really work how can we overcome that so people are confident to share the, the failures if you if you will and learn from those as much as they are the successes and i think that trickle down of evidence and good practice into day-to-day -day delivery is really what we're, we're about as well as the maybe higher level strategic thinking about well what's the direction of mental health services what's the direction of mental health provision where are we trying to go with all of that but that i think the connectivity for practitioners is about that information about what's going on in other places, how does it inform your thinking and, and practice? Thanks, thanks Steve. I think that, I think that gives, um, gives people pointers actually and, and obviously asking people that they can come to your website and the fact that people can ask questions of the, of, um, of the, of the initiative to, to find out what's happening around the world. I think that, that, that's really, really helpful. I mean, we're both social workers by background as you, you, you mentioned your, um, that uh, earlier. Um, I mean, what do you particularly value now about what social workers around the world are bringing to mental health? And, and do you see different models in, in different countries? I'd like to come on to talk a little bit about the UK in a moment, but mm. let's just have a, a little think about what's happening around the world. Well, I think my, my observations based on, um, until recently, my, my, some of my travels around the world, but also my discussions with people through Zoom and other platforms as, as, as well, who are, who are working in social work roles in other countries, uh, sort of demonstrates to me that social work remains something that is vital, uh, that is important, and that in other countries is, is represented, I think, in a slightly different way sometimes to how it is here in England. So when you go to places like the United States, it is much more common to see people with social work backgrounds and social work qualifications leading agencies, leading services at a very, very senior level uh, and a very different sort of balance. And I think that the view of social work uh, in other countries is perhaps a little, I might describe as a little less transactional than it is or has been in this country. And, and we have traveled a long way as I look back from when I originally qualified and was working in community mental health teams. You know, I, I rather ashamedly um, say that, you know, I amongst many others lap, tended to lapse into the easy language of um, medical leadership uh, and sh writing things down in shorthand that was medical shorthand. And actually all that did was um, have the, the, the opposite effect of trying, of, of where you wanted to try and establish yourself as a distinct profession. And I think in other countries that, that that's a lot clearer and that the role of social work internationally uh, recognises that social workers have a much broader range of skills than simply being the people that you go to when you need some help to find a, a client somewhere to live or sort out their welfare benefit or, or whatever it might be. They actually have a range of other therapeutic skills and interventions that they can provide. Uh, and I think you do see that in other countries, I think notably in, in, in the Netherlands in particular, but also down in, in New Zealand. Um, and I think that there's a huge value around social work. It seems to me that actually social work is an essential component of both building and maintaining the social scaffolding that we need within society. Uh, and I think that's ever more uh, pertinent right now in the immediate aftermath of the COVID crisis, but also as we move into a, a world where we have to live with COVID for probably for quite a long time, uh, and the impact that it's had, uh, both on the way in which services are delivered, but also the experience of citizens. Uh, and I think social work connects with people uh, in a really open way, and in a way that perhaps some other professions are more um, directive or on specific diagnoses, platforms or however you want to describe it. I think social work takes, uh, to borrow a phrase, you know, a much more holistic view of individuals and of communities and of society uh, and is able to draw in 
thinking about the range of other things that impact on a person's circumstances and their mental health and well-being more, more broadly. And I think you do see that in this country, but I think you see it in a more amplified way in, in a number of other places. Do you, do you think um, that is because social work is valued in a different way within services? Or, I mean, I, there's, 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 there's lots of probably quite complex historical reasons why social work is the way it is in, in mental health, and mm. we know that, and it's about the law, it's about how uh, mm. we are employed, all of that. But are there, have you got any kind of a top line kind of um, views about why you see what I'm hearing is a, is a rather more creative and sometimes a more bold, perhaps a little bit more liberated social mm. work in some other systems than, than, than we tend to have here and this is not to decry fabulous social work that social workers do in mental health all over the UK but there is that sense of being constrained by by, by rather more by more limited roles. I, I think that's a really accurate reflection of, of, of the situation I mean I think my, my sense is that very often the view of social work among other professionals and I can hear other professionals already clamoring to argue with me about this um, is that very often social workers are seen simply as the amp uh, or as the person that does as I mentioned before those almost quite transactional practical things um, I, I think th those things are of course important and they are valued um, but I think there is a there is a sort of historical cultural issue in this country which doesn't seem to exist in other places whether it's about a higher value, I think I'd be cautious about saying that, but I do think that there's a different degree of recognition about the range of skills and expertise that social workers have and the kinds of techniques that they can employ and the sort of work that they can do in some other countries and that they have a, maybe a slightly more prominent role. And I think as I look back that, and I've been, certainly been challenged on this in other places, is that as a, as a profession, and as I said earlier on, you know, I regard myself as a lapsed social worker, but still connected to it. Um, you know, I think it, it behoves us to, to be bold and to say, actually, we do have a strong role as a profession. We do have a range of skills and expertise that we can deploy. Please help us to, to do that and to work as collaborative as possible. I mean, I think on the ground, that often works really well, practitioner to practitioner, profession to profession. Uh, it's not without its tensions, I'm absolutely certain. But by and large, my observation is that works well. I think it is perhaps at the more senior level where we need to encourage leaders and policymakers to think a little bit more openly. And as we've thought about the debate about the difference, for example, between mental health and mental illness and where we've conflated terminology, that's slightly conflated roles and responsibilities. And actually, there's a role for social work in prevention and, and more public mental health approaches uh, in the same way that there is a role for them within specialist mental health treatment services. Uh, and I think we have to set out our case uh, as a profession, describe what we're good at and not apologize for it actually. Uh, you know, actually be proud of what we stand for, for our holistic approach, for our degree of engagement, for our rights-based approach, for our need to empower uh, our clients. Uh, to come up with uh, solutions and strategies that will enable them to function effectively within society and live the lives that they want to live. I'm always reminded of the words of a man called David Jones, who's the um, Commissioner of Mental Health Services in the city of Philadelphia, which is one of the leading cities uh, in the world in relation to population mental health program development. Uh, and, and David said to me once, what you have to remember, Steve, is that communities and individuals have the solutions to their problems. What they require us as professionals to do, whatever our background, is to able, enable them to deliver on those solutions rather than us propose and implement those solutions on their behalf. And I think that social work is essentially about that partnership between client and worker and organisation and client. And I think if we can really build on that, will we'll advance the cause of, of the role of social work more broadly within mental health, but actually in, in other, other spheres too, because actually I think the public's perception of social work um, is often guided by things that haven't worked well, or people think, well, it's just about children's services, when it is just so much more than that. Uh, and you see social workers working in independent sector organisations, in third sector organisations as well as in local authorities or in, in joint arrangements. So, you know, we are a, 
I still think we're a strong body and, and organisations such as Basma that do such a terrific job in trying to get the social work voice heard and I think extremely successful in, in doing that and your, your recent celebrations uh, demonstrate the, the importance of the role of Basma um, both in terms of its historical role but now more than ever I think that the, 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 the role of an advocate organisation on behalf of, of social work is, is really needed. Thanks, Steve. And, and it's, it's very uh, encouraging to know that there is a, that obviously you're involved, um, have a lead role within uh, WINHL, um, but also I know that there is genuine interest in, in the organisation at a global level in, mm. in what social work is bringing. Um, and of course, I think it chimes with um, the, uh, that, that population-based, place-based, um, those broad social issues that, that I... Uh, WIMHL, it's a mouthful, isn't it? WIMHL um, uh, are are interested in in terms of all of that the the the, the both the prevention and the response needs of people, um, uh, which are often about how they are living their lives in terms of their social circumstance, their their levels of poverty or, or affluence. Um, I know that the IMHL is interested in in things like climate change um, mm. and those kind of uh, major social sort of existential matters that affect affect societies um, across the whole globe um, obviously affecting different societies rather differently but affecting us all um, and how that affects mental health and, and both both, both um, people's mental well-being and also also how mental health services need to be um, better or in, uh, better organized and how they need to change over time and of course one of the the big global challenges right now the big global cha challenge of the moment or the one that's most in focus is is COVID-19 um, and um, I wrote something recently uh, in the Guardian is, uh, uh, about uh, some of the th some of the changes that I think might be coming for social work uh, or could come for social work uh, as a consequence of, of COVID and the experience or, or linked to it and one of those was about the fact that I feel more that more social workers whatever their field of practice will need to become more kind of fluent and knowledgeable about mental health um, because I think pe because people's broad in, in a very broad sense so the great spectrum yeah. of mental health issues that are associated with with, with COVID and there, and, and there are many um, but also that the, and that the role of, of social workers in mental health uh, services here in the UK will, will increase and that's actually for a number of different reasons I think that's partly because of dealing with some dealing with with, with COVID as it moves forward, there will be a need for exactly the sorts of social work uh, responses that you've been describing to help communities and families and individuals cope and use their strengths to cope in the long term and overcome the, 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 the normal reactions that people are having to extraordinary and painful and in many cases terrible uh, experiences. And social work has got a real role in working people with people to support them through through those kinds of uh, experiences, such as obviously bereavement, um, but also, and I'm going to come on to this in a bit, around people's experiences of inequality, which mm. is a bit large um, in, in, in the very different way that COVID has affect, affected the population. Um, so, so is that a, as that a, as a bit of a backdrop, I mean, what, what do you think um, some of the main mental health challenges of COVID are that, that are emerging that that, that uh, WIML at MHL is seeing and um, what social workers um, and, and mental health service actually need to be doing to respond um, effectively and, 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 and I wonder if you thought that the kinds of responses that we're beginning to see in the UK were, were going in the right direction. Yeah well I, I mean I think you're, I mean, you're right it, it clearly is the most significant challenge uh, that this country and other countries have faced in terms of a, a, a public health crisis for a generation or more actually um, but I think we have to be doing two things one is to be uh, careful about how we frame our language uh, in response to it and so I slightly worry about the concept of what's often described as the mental health tsunami that's coming our way as a consequence and that that implies some degree of over pathologization of, of what is a perfectly normal reaction to a really serious crisis. Uh, you know, we've all experienced, I'm sure, the um, 
degree of isolation that has come as a result of lockdown. And I know that that's been eased significantly in recent days, but you know, there are still very, very significant challenges for us all in terms of social distancing and where we can go and those kinds of things. Um, and I think that our reactions to that, our reactions to the sheer numbers of people that have died, even if they're people that we don't know, if that didn't affect you in some way, it would be slightly strange. So there are some normal reactions and we need to be careful not to overreact to those in terms of creating a mental health crisis in a sense. Uh, I think we have to ensure that the really good work that's been done by many service providers, both in this country and in, in others, to adapt the way in which they deliver their services uh, continues. I think what, it, what we have seen uh, consistently around the world is creativity, uh, breaking down of organisational barriers, uh, where it would have taken months to get agreements on things, it's taken days or even less. So it's been shown that actually when, when there's a will and a need to do some of these things, it can actually be done. Um, so I think that's a positive thing. I think what we've seen, certainly in terms of delivery of services, in some cases, that kind of move towards a more digital-based approach. Um, and on one level, you know, I'm very supportive of that, and it's really, really helpful. I think what we also have to remember is that it doesn't work for everybody. And there'll be some things that you can't do, and we have to find more creative ways to do things, maybe face-to-face. Um, you know, Zoom and Teams and however many other platforms, if like me, you've had to download various different ones, you know there's a myriad of them. Um, they work really well, but there's a dissociative element to them because you're not actually in the room and you don't pick up the same cues and people are reading their email while they're pretending to be engaged in the meeting. Um, and it's easier to do that than it is in a real meeting, uh, I guess, or a, a, a face-to-face meeting. Um, so I think we have to just be aware of the challenges of delivering interventions digitally and to make sure that we tailor that in the right way. And ultimately, that we ask people what it is that would be helpful to them. You know, we talk a lot about co-production. How do we actually live that and deliver it? And, and social work has got all the background in, in that area. And I think actually policymakers and others should be drawing on the knowledge and expertise of, of social work professionals to think about how you actually get involved in a, a really meaningful co-productive conversation and, and process about what things uh, might look like. Um, I suppose my other underlying feeling is that as we think about moving past the, the initial peak and beginning to think about how we recover and restore services and, and, and what, the, what the future looks like, um, we've got to be really careful about how we do that because my worry is that we fall back on simply building more of what we've already got and I use the word build you know advisedly and I don't just mean building hospitals or whatever but we just add on capacity to what already exists particularly in the specialist side of things now on one level that would be a good thing because everybody I think recognizes that, that more investment and greater capacity in terms of the workforce and the skill base would be helpful around specialist services. We, we need that. Um, but in doing that and building that capacity, I think we also have to reimagine a little bit about how we do these things, how we deliver services, how we engage with people and use this crisis, for want of a better word, as, as a real lever for progressive and transformative change. They, you know, we will probably not get a chance like this maybe for another 50 odd years. So we really have to grasp it and I think social work is in a prime position to influence that. And we're seeing that happening in other countries. And WIMHL brought together people from um, not just our member countries, but others recently to talk about this whole issue of how we um, respond and, and recover and build. And actually, one of the really key things to come out of those discussions, I think, is a fairly consistent sense across those countries that actually we do need to do things differently. We need to test stuff out. We uh, also need to think about uh, how we can collaborate in doing that uh, and actually share those experiences and see what works and, and, and what doesn't work. So I think there are some um, really, really big opportunities coming up uh, and we've really got to take them now because we may not have the chance to do that uh, again. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I was just wanting to um, just pick up on this whole issue around the inequalities that, that people have experienced through COVID. And I just wondered if uh, WIMHL has 
uh, done any particular work around um, the disparities in, in your mortality rates for people of colour, people um, in poverty, and, and um, obviously the, again the impact um, or the mental health impact of, 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 of discrimination, of racism, of people's experience of, of unequal treatment. Is that something that, that uh, WMA Charles been talking about, thinking about how to respond? Uh, absolutely, it's been a, 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 a big topic for many of our members uh, and all, all our countries. Um, I mean, I think what we see consistently, both within our own membership, but, but more broadly, is that the pandemic has revealed uh, in really stark terms the very wide range of inequalities that people face. Uh, and actually, in this country, you, you could end up being faced with a bit of a double whammy, and many people are faced with a du double whammy of social inequality and mental health problems, and many people from BAME communities and backgrounds face a triple whammy of discrimination and inequality. Um, thinking about uh, the response to their mental health presentation, we know uh, about overrepresentation within our services, it's, it's, it's well known. Um, what are we going to do about that? Um, but I think also in terms of things like you know, availability of affordable and safe accommodation, food security, um, welfare security in terms of, of finance, uh, work, um, not just gaining work, but maintaining work in terms of mentally healthy workplaces. Um, I think what you see across the piece is that there are a number of inequalities there. I think social work as a profession is obviously clearly cited on those things and does have an opportunity to influence them. We often talk about the social determinants of, of mental health. And I think, again, that those are well established and well known. Marma has talked about them many, many times. Uh, I think what we need to do is really think about how we tackle those through a, a cross sectorial approach, which I know is a bit, a bit of jargonese really, but how do we make mental health and tackling those inequalities, everybody's business at all levels of government, uh, whether that be national government, local government, uh, county level, unitary authority level, district level, whatever it might be. And that actually help people to see that all those organisations and all the departments within those organisations have a part to play in both tackling those inequalities and trying to promote positive mental health. I think what you see in some of the, for example, the, the well known as Thrive programmes here in England, in the West Midlands, uh, in London and in Bristol, but also in New York City, in Philadelphia, uh, as I mentioned, but also emerging now in, in Stockholm and in Amsterdam. Real opportunities to bring public health, social care, treatment services, and the third sector together to shape the way in which we consider those determinants and tackle them. Take a population-based approach to mental health. Uh, promotion, prevention, awareness, all those things. They are not soft things. I think often they're regarded as the soft end of this work and they really aren't. They're just as knotty and difficult. Uh, and by doing that, to enable specialist services to be able to focus on supporting and treating and working with the people who, who need those services and not dragging people into them when they don't need to be there simply because that appears to be the only option that is available. Um, I think that's the only way that we can do it. And I think what we see in some of the other countries in relation to the impact of COVID, I think the BAME impact, I'm not sure it's consistent across countries, but it's clearly there. Uh, we know that that's also a, a, an issue of inequality in terms of access. It's also uh, an inequality in terms of broader physical health issues, not just the, the, the COVID uh, effect. Um, certainly issues in New Zealand around uh, the Maori people, various indigenous groups in, in Canada and, and in Sweden, for example. Uh, lots of work going on to try to understand and respond to the impact that COVID has had, but within the context of mental health. And I suppose the other thing in thinking about inequality uh, is to think about what this pandemic really is. So it's started, in a sense, as a public health emergency uh, or crisis. I think it's now moved to a position where it still remains a public health emergency and crisis, but it's now a social and economic crisis and challenge. 
And those three things are not mutually exclusive. And actually, social work taking the holistic view that it does of the challenges that people face and thinking about how to solve problems and bring solutions can, I think, effectively combine those three things, thinking about public health, economics, and, and as I said before, erecting and maintaining the social scaffolding that exists. I mean, there are other things coming down the track. You, you mentioned our work around climate change. We're very lucky to work uh, with a, a man called Dr. Gary Belkin from, from New York, who previously led the New York City Thrive Program, currently doing some really interesting and I, quite, I think quite innovative work around climate and its impact on mental health. And we know that this disproportionately affects young people, in fact. It's one of the things they're most anxious about because, of course, they are the people that are going to live with uh, the impact of what's already happened and what's happening now. High rates of anxiety around the, the future of the world from a climate perspective. So I think there's a, you know, there's a macro and a micro view. How we tackle those inequalities at local level is just as important as how we tackle them at, at national and, and international level. And by sharing that information, those experiences, and drawing in a wider range of professionals, particularly social work, and encouraging social work leaders to feel able to talk about the importance of their role, the ideas that they've got, and to collaborate with people, not just in their own country, but in others, I think will create uh, the circumstances and the conditions for uh, addressing those challenges. Now, of course, it won't be the work of a moment, uh, but I think that you know, social work as a profession is clearly imbued with a desire to do those things, and I think can help to bring others with it and to bring citizens along on that, on that journey too. That's really crucial. Steve, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I think that's a good place to conclude, actually. Um, it's been really uh, great to talk to you today. And thank you for speaking um, so encouragingly, really, about the role of social work globally and, and in the UK. I think there's a call for us to be more bold, but also to hear, um, hearing your uh, your view and your um, uh, com conviction really about the role of social work in mental health in this very broad sense I think is have been really really helpful so thanks I personally look forward to engaging more with IIMHL um, get, get, getting the uh, acronym right um, in the future and, um, and, and thank you very much for speaking today and I'm sure that it will be really um, encouraging and very helpful for, for members and for social workers and beyond that so um, thanks very much Steve and uh, to our viewers until the next time please stay safe and keep in touch <laughs>